Hello everybody, this is Tim here again. I got my Batman shirt on, baby. I got Batman playing in the background. <laughs> I'm ready to kick badass, baby. But <laughs> anyway, it's one of my, this is this, Batman is my favorite comic book character, hands down. I love the movies, I love the animated films, I love the animated shows, Batman animated series, which I want to do a review for one day. It's awesome. Uh, just to jump into the movies. I have the uh, still book, blue right here, a Batman one. This is a really cool still book, I like still books. If you like Batman, you should get this. Pretty sure it has the same professional features though as the regular Blu ray. If you get a chance to get the still book, I recommend getting it. Sorry, Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton, and Kim Basinger. Kim Basinger is the weakest of the top three of the cast. She's alright, but she's. She's there. Uh, Jack Nicholson, great as the Joker in the movie. He only has maybe two little scenes where he goes off on too much of like a Jack Nicholson type vibe, where he's a little bit too Nicholson ish and less of the Joker. He's just a little bit more Nicholson ish. Uh, one scene is like when he's uh, uh, shooting a bunch of times, shooting Jack Palance a bunch of times, his own boss in the movie. He just like keeps shooting him over and over and he's like dancing around doing it. Uh, that's a little bit too Jack Nicholson ish. <clears throat> but, uh, other than like one or two little spots, he is the Joker pretty much through the whole movie. Uh, except for one or except for maybe two little scenes. No performance is completely flawless. But, uh, but yeah, he has maybe like two little scenes where he goes off to Jack Nicholson ish. <clears throat> but Michael Keaton, really great Batman. He's great as Batman. I just, his voice is also better than Christian Bell's. <coughs> it's just great when he grabs the, the, the thug on top of the building, and he's like, the guy's like, what are you? And then uh, Michael Keaton goes, I'm Batman. <laughs> it's great. This is great. Michael Keaton's voice is just great. I love the scene in the movie when he's Bruce Wayne, and he's like talking to the Joker, and he's like, you want to get nuts? And he like takes a poker and smashes a vase and goes, come on, let's get nuts. <laughs> It sounds like Beetlejuice. I love that. Pretty, uh, weaknesses for the movie, though, is that the movie is a little bit... Uh, I mean, I could have used just a little bit more backstory on Batman. Some people complain there's too... There's not enough... Some people complain there's too much of the Joker's movie. But uh, I never really felt that. I mean, you get more of the Joker's origin. You get the Joker's origin and stuff in the movie. So there's that. But uh, I still felt like Batman was the main star. Um, I like how they contrast each other. Uh, Joker's really flamboyant and over the top, and Batman's really, like, cold, you know, and uh, not very talkative. Burton chooses to use, like, the shadowy Batman who doesn't talk much and doesn't have much to do with society or whatever. It's kind of a, uh, just like a recluse. He just doesn't want to be involved in anything. Even Bruce Wayne is, like, the type of character who doesn't want to be in the public eye at all. He just tries his best to stay out of the spotlight whatsoever which is different from a comic book one, which wants to be more in the spotlight and act really goofy and play up his playboy image of how stupid he is. The only people would never suspect him of being Batman. But, uh, either one kind of works, really. <clears throat> but, uh, so basically you get Jack Nicholson as Jack Napier in the movie. He, uh, falls into a vat of chemicals, comes back as the Joker, kills his former boss, takes over his takes over his former boss's criminal organization. Uh, I love the look of this film. It's got like a really retro type look to it with a, like a modern uh, type vibe going on, but with like everybody dressed like the 19, uh, like 40s or something, or 50s, or not, not the 50s, but more like the 40s, or 30s and 40s or something like that, like the old gangster style. Everybody's dressed in like old gangster type style. Joker's pretty much like a mob boss in this, and Jack Nicholson has like a permanent grin on his face. I love his reaction where this guy, this guy's talking to him, and he says, "What's with that stupid grin?" And Jack Nicholson goes, "Life's been good to me." <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> it's, it's great. One thing I can say though is that Heath Ledger was the better Joker. Jack Nicholson's performance in this one is creepy, and he, he does creep me out in one or two scenes. But uh, but Heath Ledger's performance was genuinely scary. But Jack Nicholson never makes it to that. You're either laughing with Jack Nicholson or you're creeped out by him slightly in certain scenes. The two greatest scenes in the movie, in my opinion, are number one when Michael King goes, I'm oh, Batman. And the other one is when uh, <coughs> Jack Nicholson kills this guy by having a joy buzzer on his hand, like shaking his hand and frying him into a skeleton. And Jack Nicholson, after everybody leaves, he's like walking around the dude's skeleton, like talking to the skeleton. And the guy dead, Jack Nicholson's like, your pals, they're not bad people. Maybe we should give him a few, a few days to think it over. <laughs> He's like, uh, no. <laughs> he goes, well, you are a vicious bastard. I'm glad you did. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Um, and there's another cool scene where Jack Nicholson like, snaps his dude in the throat with a, a pen or whatever, and he turns around. And, or a feather, I mean. He turns around and goes, the pen is truly mightier than the sword. <laughs> I love that. He's hilarious in this movie, Jack Nicholson is. He's a lot funnier than the, the Heath Ledger Joker, but he's not as intimidating as the Heath Ledger Joker. He's not as intimidating as the Heath Ledger one, though. Uh, another thing is that at the end of the movie when the Joker plans to gas everybody, poison everybody in the whole city and just kill everybody, uh, uh, Michael Keaton comes flying in and the Batwing, the Batwing, uh, when it's like when the Joker shoots it and it's falling to the ground, you can tell it's a model some shots. It kind of dates the movie a little. You can tell it's a model. Um, other than that, though, the special effects are all great. They still hold up. I love the bat suit. I like this bat suit that Michael Keaton wears in this movie better than the one in Batman Returns and in the, in the Christopher Nolan movies. Uh, Kim Basinger plays Vicki Vale, who's like sleeps with Bruce Wayne on the first date. Their relationship is like really rushed. But you gotta get it in there. He has to have a love interest for some reason. Every superhero does. So she pretty much falls in love with him and she just finds out that he's Batman, of course. And same old shit, different day. <laughs> Nothing really inter super interesting with their relationship. Uh, at the end of the movie, the Joker kidnaps Vicky Bell, takes her into this big church or whatever, abandoned church. Michael Keaton is in there and makes it to the top of the top of the church. Like these Joker like thugs pop out of nowhere and <laughs> just start fighting Batman. He gets some cool action scenes, so it's like, how the hell? Why are they there? How did they get there? I mean, we know why they're there. They're there to fight Batman, but how the hell did they get there? There's no explanation. But Tim Burton had, uses his quirky sense in this movie too. <laughs> I mean, here you get the idea that Tim Burton is actually trying to make a Batman movie. He really is, uh, and he adds in like his little director flavors in the movie to liven it up. Get like the little, uh, his quirkiness in the movie, like with uh, this random Joker thug who pops out of nowhere and starts doing kung fu and everything, and tries to beat up Batman, he just appears from nowhere, and Batman takes him out like with one hit, it's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, Michael Keaton's great, uh, Jack Lewis is great, great. Kim Basinger is just alright. Another thing is, uh, the guy plays Alfred, I like him in the movie, but you don't really get that like, really deep connection with him. I mean, there's not enough of it, really, but Michael Goff still does a great job in the movie as Alfred, though. Commissioner Gordon, though, is, like, really underused and doesn't really do much at all. Uh, they would they would uh, fix that mistake in the Nolan movies. In the Nolan movies, Gary Oldman is a much better Commissioner Gordon than Pat Hinkle. And I like Pat Hinkle, I do. As an actor, I like Pat Hinkle. He's not really giving anything to do here. <clears throat> But, uh, at the end of the movie, <coughs> sorry, I keep coughing. I coughed in my last review, too. I don't know what's going on. I get, hope I'm not getting sick again, but anyway. But, uh, you think that the Joker tries to get away, but Batman, like, shoots a grappling hook, and it, like, attaches the Joker's leg to this statue. And the Joker's trying to get away on a helicopter, and the statue, like, starts weighing him down, and the Joker falls to his death. So it's like the, it's like Batman inadvertently killed him by trying to stop him from getting away. Another thing is that Batman does kill people in this movie. Some people really have a problem with that and hate that. Um, I really don't personally have a problem with that. I prefer a Batman who doesn't kill because I think that makes him more interesting. I prefer a Batman who does not kill. But in the earlier comics, Batman did kill people. 
So if you want to go with that version of Batman, I really don't have a problem with it. That's the director's choice of whatever style or whatever version of the character he prefers. I mean, so either one, as long as it's an interesting character and version of Batman, I really don't give a shit, honestly. Um, the only time I have a problem with it is when after Batman finds out that the Joker is the one that killed his parents, he like goes into the uh, this facility or whatever this factory I made where the Joker's men are working at. He just hopes he's hoping to kill the Joker, but he just blows the whole place up hoping to kill the Joker in the explosion. And he kills everybody in there just like mercilessly. I really don't like that. I don't mind that he kills, but when he just kills when he doesn't have to kill, that just makes him seem like a punisher. And it just that makes him seem too un Batmanish. Makes him seem does he doesn't seem enough like Batman at that point. That's one scene I did hate. Uh, another thing some people have a problem with the Joker being the one who killed Batman's parents, considering it like too coincidental. But I don't have a problem with it because Bottom line is that this film is a comic book movie straight up. The whole city of Gotham City is a city that can only exist in a comic book. And the look of Gotham City in this movie I like better than any of the Christopher Nolan movies. Um, where they all try to make the city look realistic. A place called Gotham City needs to look really cool and gothic. And that's only ever really been captured like that in my opinion in this movie. It looks Gotham City looks the best in this first Batman movie here. It really looks awesome and epic. It looks like a big crime grid city. It's really good with the colors and like the dark like palette or whatever that would be copied for Batman the Animated Series. But it looks great here. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, because A, it's a comic book film, and in a comic book, two characters that uh, create each other is something you would see in a comic book all the time. Joker creates Batman. Batman creates Joker. That is something you would see in a comic book. So it doesn't matter that it's coincidental because it is a comic book. This film knows it's a comic book and is created specifically to look like a comic and be like a comic. So something like that that would happen in a comic doesn't bother me here because it feels like you're watching a comic come to life. So it makes perfect sense in this universe. It's, you know, it's like fate. It's like one created the other. Now they're, you know, at odds. It works perfectly. <coughs> so I have no problem with it. So yeah, all in all, just to give my rating, if I haven't already, I don't remember if I did. Four stars. I get a kick out of it. Oh, and the Prince music, some people hate that. And I'm like, that seems like something a Joker would listen to. You know, goofy Prince music. Seems like, like goofy party Prince music seems like something he would listen to. It does date the film a little bit, but I'm like, so what? What does it matter that it's an 80s film? 80s films are usually the best films. So, who cares? <laughs> but anyway, you can't appreciate a movie just because it has 80s songs in it because it was made in the 80s. And I'm sorry if you got a stick up your ass. But anyway. <laughs> um, and the scene with Jack Nicholson in the museum, like, dancing to France, I believe, Party Man. He's, like, knocking shit down. He's, like... Just like hit statues and knocks it down and all that. It's hilarious. It's great. It's funnier than shit. Uh, Tim Burton's quirky sense really works good here. He's really trying to make a Batman film here, but at the same time, he's trying to add in like his different, you know, director flavors and styles that he does in other movies and, you know, uh, liven the movie up with it. But he really is trying to make an actual Batman film here. So that. Uh, really works in this movie's favor. Four stars. Batman Returns. We'll also have on Steelbook. Again. I recommend getting this still book if you haven't already. Get Michael Keaton, Dane DeVito, Michelle Pfeiffer. Now, when I kept saying that Tim Burton seemed like he was really trying to make a Batman film for the first one, I kept bringing it up because I get to this one, which I'll go ahead and give my rating. It's three stars. It's good. It's not great. It never makes it to the greatness level of the first one. Think about this movie. The first movie, he was trying to make a Batman film. This movie, Tim Burton has carte blanche. He can do whatever the hell he wants with this sequel. And in this movie, he, he basically in this movie, the first movie was an actual Batman film. This movie is Tim Burton's version of Batman. 
this is how Tim Burton completely sees Batman the character and the other characters. <coughs> this is his straight up version of Batman. Basically with this movie, Tim Burton just took his regular style and completely fused it with the Batman characters in the universe and created his own style of Batman. For better and for worse. Uh, the Penguin, I do like his version of the Penguin better than the comic book one. The one in the comic books is interesting, it is decent. But he could never carry a whole movie. He's just like a short, fat guy who likes penguins. I mean, that's really it. There's not many two, not very, very many levels to do the personality. So this version of the penguin in this movie is better than the comic book one. I'm sorry, it is. The one in the comics just couldn't carry a movie, a whole movie. He could not by not by himself. Um, maybe as like a secondary villain, but not as the main one. Basically, in this one, you got the penguin. He's born deformed. He gets thrown over into the sewers by his mom and dad, who are played by two people from Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Uh, I don't know the actress's name, but she plays the mom in Pee-wee's Big Adventure. I love Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Great movie. Uh, you get Paul Rubens, and, who played, obviously, Pee-wee, <laughs> who are Pee-wee's parents. They hate their baby because he's deformed. <clears throat> they throw him over in the sewers, and he gets raised by penguins who, who escape from the zoo. <laughs> basically, or came from a broken down, run down zoo. It's a silly idea because, once again, this movie is structured like a comic book and to be a live action comic book. It's plausible. It's, it works because this movie is a comic book come to life. I keep saying stuff like that because people who are obsessed with the Nolan movies keep saying, I don't like those first two old Batman movies because they're uh, too unrealistic. And I'm like, that's because they're totally different styles in the Nolan movies. I love the Nolan movies. I do. Just because something's more straight up comic book style doesn't make it bad. I'm like, get the lead out of your ass, man, or the stick out of your ass. Shit. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, anyway. Uh, I'm fine with the origin of the Penguin. The origin of Catwoman, though, you get Michelle Pfeiffer, who plays a great Catwoman. She's really interesting. Actually, more interesting than the one from the Nolan movies. But I prefer the one from the Nolan movies, actually, because this one is, is a supernatural character. Because she gets killed by Christopher Walken, who's her boss, who has some kind of evil power plant scheme he wants to do. But it's never explained in the movie what exactly it is he's wanting to do. He, like, kills Selena Kyle, and she gets brought back to life by these alley cats who, like, breathe life back into her. I, I know it's like a metaphor thing, uh, because cats, uh, like, I don't know, I've always, I've always been considered... They have like a mystical quality about them, about them in like folk, folklore and stuff, or whatever folklore. I mean, so they like bring her back to life by biting on her and stuff, and it seems like they're breathing life back into her. I know some people try to say she's not supernatural, but I'm sorry. You obviously didn't watch the movie, you think she's not supernatural. I'm not trying to be mean, but I mean, give me a break here. At the end of the movie, she gets shot multiple times, point blank range, and keeps coming. And then even kills herself. Along with Christopher Walken, by electrocuting, uh, by electrocuting herself and Christopher Walken, and she's still alive because she ha has nine lives <coughs> in the movie. She is a supernatural character because she is Tim Burton's straight-up version of the character. But my problem with that is because it's made her supernatural, it's it's too un batman -ish. There's not very many supernatural characters in the Batman world, as it is. So by taking a character who's already just human in the comics and making her supernatural, it just changes her too much from the regular character. I love her costume, though, that Tim Burton has made. Uh, her costume is cool, but the whole supernatural thing just takes away too much from who she is in the comics. For me, personally. Some people might be fine with it, I just, I just couldn't do it. It just takes it away too. Just takes away too much of the standard Catwoman character. <clears throat> this version does. The supernatural aspect does. But I like how she's got like split personality disorder though, and she's like, it's like she doesn't want to. It's like she's fighting with herself whether or not to be Catwoman or not. And another thing is that she's she's pretty much an anti-hero really. She only wants to kill Christopher Walken's character because he killed her, and the Penguin character Danny DeVito. Um, <clears throat> Wants to be like become a, he wants to to keep, get revenge on the city for what his parents did to him. So he wants he well he wants to get revenge on high class society because that's what his parents were members of. 
so he wants to kill all the firstborn sons of high class society because that's what he was. It's like a Moses type thing. <coughs> so he wants to kill all the firstborn sons of the, the rich people, really. Uh, but at the same time, he starts liking the fact that he's become more accepted in society because Christopher Walken's character is wants to use him to wants to make the penguin mayor so he can gain control of. Uh, of the city even more, so he can get like his power plant, his evil power plant, uh, made or whatever. It's to, the whole power plant thing is stupid. Christopher Walken's character uh, kind of could have could have could have got wrote out of the movie really completely. You didn't really need him, even though Christopher Walken does fine. But you really need the, the, his character in the movie. Um, but yeah, so he wants to make the Penguin mayor because of that. But at the same time, when the penguin's running for mayor, he's starting to become accepted in society when he's never been before, so he really starts liking being accepted. He likes the villain, but because he also uh, is still a scumbag, <laughs> he wants to kill Batman, uh, he's really a conflicted character, really. I mean, he's like a, well, I mean, he's like a multi-dimensional character. He likes being accepted, but at the same time, he's still a scumbag because of the how he was brought up, he never had love as a, as a child or from his parents, and he was born in a sewer and raised in a sewer, so he never got to experience a real family or anything, so he's got like real scumbag tendencies, and he keeps wanting to have sex with hot, attractive women, which I don't blame him, it's because he's never had sex before, at least I assume, I mean, he might have, shit, I don't know, so, but at the same time, though, he wants to kill Batman, <sighs> and, uh, so when he gets found out uh, that he's been, like, messing with the city or whatever by, uh, uh, by, by acting like he cares about what happens to Gotham City and all that shit, when he gets found out that he's just been playing them, uh, the city turns on him, the people do, and he, uh, he feels bad, really bad, because he feels rejected by society once again. Uh, another thing about this movie that this movie is more macabre than the first one. It's not really darker than the first one, but it's more macabre than the first one. It's like, it's more more Tim Burton's regular style. It's regular quirky style. It's like an even darker version of his regular quirky style, like more macabre version. I mean, you got like more macabre visuals of like the penguin biting a guy's nose and shooting out blood and uh, the penguin wanting to kill him, like all the firstborn children. I'm like, damn. <laughs> it's like a dark this movie has like a dark fairy tale type vibe to it, really. But yeah, a lot of parents hated that, hence why we got Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. But uh, yeah, this film is darker than the first one. Big one has a circus gang, but they really feel like they would be more at home working with the Joker than the Big one, really. But uh, they are, they're alright here in the movie. The action isn't as good as the first movie. I didn't think in this one there's also not a lot of action. Also, another thing is that the penguin gets the blueprints to the Batmobile. It's never explained how he gets the blueprints to the Batmobile. He messes the Batmobile up. Batman uh, uh, almost wrecks in it. He escapes. Uh, and he get, he, well, the police are chased after Batman because the penguin is framed for murder of this girl in the city or whatever called the Ice Princess. And uh, Batman's running from the police, but the Batmobile's been messed up. And he uh, breaks out of the Batmobile inside this little tiny, uh, like, bat pod type thing. He might as well be the bat pod before the, it's the bat pod before the new version of the, in the Christopher Nolan movies. And he escapes in this little bat pod thing through this, like, really tight, uh, space that he can't fit through with the Batmobile. And that's how he manages to escape. Uh, he ex I mean, that's how he manages to get away from the police in that scene, is in this little bat pod thing. So, that's a cool action scene. There's really not a lot of action scenes here. Once again, it's never explained how the penguin got the blueprints of the Batmobile. I guess he bought them on eBay or something. It's never really explained. <sighs> um, then you get to the end of the movie, where it takes place in the sewer. Batman's, of course, saved the children. He comes out with the penguin's ass. The penguin's got this little uh, four-wheel drive duck that he keeps running away in. And uh, Batman catches up to him. <laughs> Batman is like in the fight with the penguin. I love the penguin's line here. Penguin is on Batman's back, and he goes, "You're just jealous because you're because I'm a genuine freak, and you have to wear a mask." And Michael Keaton goes, "You might be right." <laughs> I 
I thought that was hilarious. Michael Keaton wants to get his mind here. But Michael Keaton is not given as much to do in this movie. I, um, I do think some people overblow it when they try to act like this movie is just strictly about the villains. It's not really just strictly about the villains, but they do get more screen time here than Batman. And the movie does feel more about the villains than Batman because it worked in the first movie because it was just one villain, so it's a pretty good balance between Batman and the Joker. In the second movie, because you got Michelle Pfeiffer, Danny DeVito, and Christopher Walken, you got three villains, plus, uh, you know, Batman. It's like all three of them are, all three of the new characters, get with Catwoman and Christopher Walken, are all getting their stories told. And plus, you got Catwoman and Penguin's origin stories being told in the same movie. So, because there's more characters here, it gets less screen time for Batman. He gets more overshadowed in this movie than it did in the first one. Because there's so many more characters in this movie than what it is, really. Uh, it's not because I feel like part of the favor of the villains over the uh, hero. I just feel like it's because there's so many damn villains. But, uh, anyway. I do think Burton likes the visuals of the bad guys so much better than uh, Batman. And the reason, uh, well, actually I take that back. I mean, I, I mean, I take back what I said before. I do think Burton favors the villains a little bit more over Batman, at least in this movie, because these two villains, Penguin and Catwoman, are his versions of these characters, and you either like them or you won't. They're not the comic book versions. They are Tim Burton's versions. Um, so I feel like that's why he favored them slightly more over Batman in this one. It's because Batman, he has to go by the one created in the first movie, whereas with the two new characters in this movie added in this movie with Penguin and Catwoman, they are straight up his versions of those characters. So that's why I feel like he has my personal attachment to them. Yeah, at the end of the movie, Catwoman kills Christopher Walken's character. Penguin falls to his death. Uh, but you think he's dead, he's not. He comes up behind Batman. Gets ready to kill Batman, but he picks the wrong umbrella, and he's like, oh shit, I picked the cute one. And then he goes, I'll murder you momentarily, but first I need a cold glass of ice water. And then he falls down, and then like his penguins, you know, come out and like push him out into the sewer water or whatever, give him like a burn on that scene. It's to, it's to show you that the penguin is really a tragic figure, which he really is. He's really a pitiful figure. Uh, in the movie, no matter how evil he gets in the movie, he does get pretty evil. He wants to kill the children or whatever of the city, but he still is just like a really pitiful figure, no matter what. You see, he's more or less an angry child in, a, in an adult's body trying to strike out against humanity. The real enemy in this movie is made clear by Tim Burton. The real enemy in this movie is upper class rich people, basically. It's the real enemy, like Piglet's parents who throw him out of the water to die, and, uh, and Christopher Walken, who's also a rich member of society as well, uh, who even though he's a monster like Penguin, he gets more respect from society because he looks normal. So yes, the real enemies in this movie are high-class society. They are the main villains. Uh, so yeah, the Penguin gets burrow, let's see. Catwoman electrocutes herself and Christopher Walken. Uh, you don't know what happened to Catwoman, though. But at the but at the end of the movie though, um, at the end of the movie though, you get a Catwoman like standing up on top of the building, you know, watching the bat signal, which is how the first movie ended, except with Batman looking at the bat signal. Uh, so it's like a callback to the first movie. I like that. Also, Batman finds Catwoman's pet cat and takes it with him, so he knows Catwoman's still alive. He knows what it should Sorry. So. It's more of a somber ending. I can see why parents would have a problem with this movie because it is darker than the first one. This movie is not a superhero popcorn movie. This is a superhero tragedy film. Everything in this movie just goes from bad to worse to worse to worse. Uh, it just gets more and more sad in the movie, really. This is not a happy film. It's about messed up characters striking back at society with Penguin and Catwoman, basically. And how society screwed them over upper class society has and how they're striking back in society. Pretty much what the movie's about. It's a dark Batman tragedy movie is what it is. It's not a Batman superhero popcorn movie. It's, it, which is why I can see that fans of the first one might have had more of a problem with this sequel. But in my opinion, I don't have a problem with a dark Batman superhero tragedy. I don't. So, never bothered me. <laughs> the scene at the end though where Batman rips his mask off to show Catwoman that he's Bruce Wayne it's kind of stupid because he does it right in front of Christopher Walken. And if Catwoman would have, like, 
just let him take Christopher Walken to jail. Christopher Walken would have probably just got out of jail and then just hired a bunch of people to go kill Bruce Wayne. I'm like, that's stupid. But the reason Burton did that, though, is I think because he structured the movie. He, I mean, this movie has like an operatic feel to it, some of the action scenes and stuff. And I think he was just going for like an opera type vibe at the end where, you know, he's just, he's so in love with Catwoman. It's just like he doesn't give a shit about revealing his identity. It's like, you know, the end of the movie, they just need a big operatic ending, you know, for the movie. So he just wants to rip his mask off, you know, and just show her who he is, you know, connect with her, you know, humanly, emotionally, deep, whatever. So I think that's why he did it, honestly. But it's still stupid, no matter how you try to rationalize it. But yeah, all in all, good sequel, nothing great. I do like the movie, uh, but it is it is only a good movie. It's not great like the first one. If you do enjoy the first one, though, I would recommend watching it. There's nothing to like go, ah, yay, about this. Beautiful visuals, though. The look of the movie really reminds me of Edward Scissorhands and Nightmare Before Christmas. As a matter of fact, this movie has more in common with Nightmare Before Christmas than Edward. Well, I mean, this movie has more in common with Edward Scissorhands than it does the first Batman. Um, Style-wise. But, yeah, I don't ever... I actually like that, though, because I like the idea of Burton doing something completely different from the sequel, uh, style-wise, instead of repeating the first one. Also, I don't like the way Gotham City looks in the movie. It looks much smaller than the, than the way the city was stylized in the first one. And I don't like that. Gotham City needs to be like a real big place. Tall-ass buildings, and it looks way too small here. But, yeah, good sequel. I like Catwoman and the Penguin. They're good villains. I like them in the movie. Uh, Michael Keaton's fine once again, although he doesn't get as much to do here. He gets, gets overshadowed by the villains. Uh, Michael Goff returns to Alfred. He's fine once again. Same old shit. Just as good as he was in the first movie. But, yeah. Good sequel, but not great. So, I'm going to split this video into two parts. Maybe more. Uh, because I wanted to spend the first video talking about the two Tim Burton movies. But, uh, just to end it, Great movie. If you like it, check out the sequel, which is not as good, but it is good. But nothing to write home about, but it is good. I wouldn't put it in the top 10 best superhero movies. Maybe top 20, but not top 10. But it is But it is a good movie, though. Definitely worth watching. And definitely one of the better superhero movies, you see. But not one of the best. So I'll see you guys again with video 2.